Welcome back to America's Forum right here on Newsmax TV. I'm John Bach. And I'm J.D. Hayworth. A note at the outset, John, as we were watching video in the, high, in the uh, headlines, and you mentioned Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, we saw the late, great Rodney Dangerfield from his motion picture, Back to School. That obviously was not Governor Walker. Now, once we've gotten that cleared up, time to talk about politics and pop culture. And here's a story where those two things collide in American life. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie says he will oppose any effort to legalize marijuana in the Golden State, pardon me, in the Garden State. Democrat State Senator Nicholas Katari introduced a legalization bill there last month. Now, a Monmouth University Asbury Park press poll shows that nearly 60% of New Jersey adults think alcohol and tobacco pose a greater hazard than pot but they're split on whether to legalize it. 48% in favor, 47% opposed. Marijuana legalization often identified as an issue closely aligned with a libertarian political philosophy, but libertarianism encompasses much more than that. And joining us here to talk about that, Newsmax TV correspondent Andy Tillis, our pal John Bogman, and right here live on the set, it's Matt Kibbe. Matt, we're glad to have you. And we're pleased you're here to talk about your new book with a great title, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff, a Libertarian Manifesto. We should point out for purposes of full disclosure as well that Matt is also president and CEO of Freedom Works. And Matt, we welcome you in studio here to America's Forum. It's good to be here. Thank you. Now I'm going to reincarnate that Lawrence Spivak role from years ago on Meet the Press. Our questioning begins with Andy Tillis. Thank you, J.D. Hello, <laughs> Mr. Kibbe. How are you? Wonderful. My first question is, what are you hoping to achieve with your book? You know, I really wanted to translate a lot of very complicated, big books into a simple philosophy and show people that libertarianism isn't a scary, weird thing. It's, it's really the basis of, of the, the American model. Ronald Reagan famously said that the heart and soul of conservatism is libertarianism, and a lot of people are checking it out now, maybe because of Rand Paul, maybe because of, of the internet, they're, they're, they're seeking these ideas, and I wanted to make it uh, accessible. And, oh, Go ahead. Sorry. And if you're hoping to get a certain person elected, is your book something that can be packaged into something that can help a candidate run? Well, I, I do try to translate the values of liberty into simple messages like don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. But I do interview in the book more than one p potential presidential candidate. I talked to both Rand Paul and Ted Cruz. Um, I think on if you compare these values to the entire field in 2016, more and more Republicans are starting to think about liberty and limited government and why government control is a really bad thing. And that's that, I think that's good for America. And you're hoping everyone will take that away from reading your book. Yes, we're not choosing sides. I think liberty's for everybody. Thank you. Now, you. You can kind of visualize, Matt, the Venn diagram here, the Republican Party, and you have on one side libertarians, on the other side you have Christian conservatives. And it's been argued that that, middle, that area in the middle is getting smaller and smaller. Do you think that can change with a guy like Rand Paul? I don't, I don't actually buy that, that diagram. Uh, this is, libertarianism is about political philosophy. It doesn't tell you where to worship. It doesn't tell you how to live your own life, um, um, those, those most important social values. What it says is, don't let the government intervene in marriage. Don't let the government I interrupt the most important social institutions because those institutions, are, those institutions are based on free people coming together in voluntary association. So I, you know, that's the caricature, but I don't buy it. And the, and the, the follow up to that would be, you know, you have cases where conservatives have, in state legislatures, have had laws like mandatory uh, sonograms and things like that nature, supposed, uh, you know, more invasive things of that nature. Is there room? I mean, I know libertarians aren't going to worry about the, the conservative Christians, but is it going to work the other way around as well? Well, you look at, uh, you look at uh, Ron Paul, you look at Rand Paul, you look at Justin Amash. These are very faithful pro-life guys. So again, the, the distinction is not, you know, we're trying to create a fight that really doesn't exist. Um, and today, the real threat, I would argue, to, to people of faith is government coming in and telling them how to live their lives, how to raise their kids, what to teach them, whether or not they're allowed to bake a cake or not bake a cake. I think the tables have turned and we should all be defending our liberties regardless of our, our, 
our moral philosophy. As you mentioned that, I think about city uh, city government coming in with kids with lemonade stands, trying yeah. to stop them on their block, reaching the point of absurdity. Matt, you, you offered the historical uh, reference from Ronald Reagan. I remember now, gosh, 20 years ago, the year I was elected to Congress, 1994, we heard a lot in Washington about the Leave Us Alone Coalition. In a sense, could your book be nicknamed Leave Us Alone uh, 2.0? It's, it's really the same idea, and it's, it, it goes back to our founding. I mean, Ronald Reagan didn't come up with that idea either. Um, this is the American model. And when, you know, I think when Republicans have slid into what I call big government conservatism, using the power of the state to tell people how to live their lives, um, subsidizing faith-based charities, they mess up everything they touch. They can't balance the budget. Why would we want them to do these really important things? Now. It's interesting, and you referenced earlier the fact that you, you speak, have extended comments from, from uh, Rand Paul and from Ted Cruz. But you take a look at Rand Paul right now, and obviously Mr. Cruz has been very impressive in, in this first term in Washington, but Rand Paul, at least to me, would seem to be a first among equals in terms of young up-and-comers. The only guy I know of who can get a standing ovation at CPAC and get a standing ovation at Berkeley has he emerged as first among equals uh, with these newcomers to the Senate? Certainly in polling right now he has, but you know he's been at it um, two years longer at least than, ten, than Ted Cruz has. But I think that's one of those teachable moments as our president would say. If you can give essentially the same speech at CPAC and then go to Berkeley, you're connecting to new audiences that Republicans have not been able to bring into their tent, particularly young people. And go ahead. I was hoping you could tell the American people the difference between the Tea Party and the um, Freedom Works. Okay, yeah, so we're, we're a service center. We're based in D.C. We're a national organization. We've been around since 1984, obviously preceding the Tea Party, but that community, and it's morphing into something else. I think the Tea Party is one of the most important social movements in, in modern American history, but I think it's morphing into a broader liberty movement. And you, you go to most states and you discover that people are defining themselves around these values. And it's, I call it beautiful chaos because it's a, it's a big mess of humanity that's doing really important stuff. And Matt, don't you think that you really need to support a candidate, you personally, to get your message out there? Well, for 2016, I, I think I would be doing a disservice to that community if I pre-told them what to think about this. I like competition. I, th I think uh, that the Republicans' in instinct to pre-choose the next guy in line is such a losing strategy. Let's have these guys hash it out. Let's have a serious conversation about what the Republican Party stands for. Let's see if every one of these candidates can pass the test when it's a crisis. And, and also, there are some practical reasons, too, within the tax code in terms of uh, tax status, which brings us to the headlines today and Lois Lerner. Now, we know the left loves to play victim, and inevitably there are going to be cat calls about you're, you're, you're uh, absolutely being unfair to Lois Lerner. Your take on political perception and this case involving the IRS run amok in the person of Lois Lerner. We should all be af afraid of gray-suited bureaucrats that you don't know having such unfettered power in the way that she went after mom and pop tea partiers who are trying to make the country a better place. Let's not forget what they were trying to do. Um, it reminds me, I talk about in the book, the way that uh, some gray-suited bureaucrat from the FBI went after Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King simply because he organized a march on Washington. They went after his nonprofit. They went after him personally. The IRS started auditing people. If that sounds familiar, that's exactly what's going on today. And, and we need to rein in these unfireable bureaucrats with all of this discretionary authority. Matt Kibbe, uh, Dr. Franklin said you can't judge a book by its cover. But I have to say, based on title alone, you have the book of the year. Don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. A Libertarian Manifesto. We are so very, very happy to have you here, and we look forward to speaking more about political philosophy and practical politics in just a little while. We'd love to have you weigh in on this concept and notion, and you can do so by uh, checking our social sites. For example, you can tweet us at Newsmax, hashtag America's Forum, 
or why don't you email us our address connectednewsmaxtv.com.